Hello and welcome to section 3.1 on elementary principles. I will be uploading a little less often as my university courses have started back up again and so I'm going to be busy, but I will still try to get a video at least at, out at least once every two weeks. Sorry that that's a bit slow, but I can only manage that at the moment. We start with velocity and the dot notation. Considering a point particle with a trajectory of x and then we describe that as a function of time, the particle has a velocity, where we use the dot to represent the time derivative. This was invented by Newton, but it did not become standard. This leads us to momentum, where if a particle has a mass m, then momentum is defined as that mass times that particle's velocity. Newton's second law states that the time derivative of momentum is force. And when we take the time derivative of velocity, we get acceleration and recover the familiar f equals ma. Then, the work done by a force f on a particle is defined as the below line integral, where basically the dot product of the force and the velocity can be simplified as a path, so the force that acts along a path. And it follows that the change in kinetic energy t is equal to work done. In the case where work is independent of the path from point one to two, the force is said to be conservative and is written as the gradient of a potential. For conservative forces, the work evaluates to the following line integral, and which can just satisfy this equation right here. And thus total energy is equal to T plus V, where V is the potential gradient, or not the gradient, but just the potential, and then T is the kinetic energy. Now the outer product is used instead of the cross product to define an angular momentum. This allows us to represent it with a bivector, as normally, when you represent angular momentum, you use an ax axial vector. So you have some axial vector, let's just say alpha, and then you have the plane of rotation here, and then this is the axial vector. This doesn't really give a ton of information regarding what the actual rotation is. And so it's a lot more natural to use the outer product, which gives us which gives us an oriented plane that tells us where this rotation is taking place. And we can thus simplify angular momentum to this equation right here. And we find torque through L's derivative. We can represent it a little bit differently if we consider the unit vector x hat and the normal vector x. Where x, I'm not meaning normal as in orthogonal, I'm just meaning x. If we define r as the magnitude of x, then we can define time derivative of x as this right here, which leads us to this representation. And six, since x hat squared is equal to one because it's a unit vector, you can see that the derivative of the dot product is equal to zero, which means that we can just remove the outer product and simplify it as this, which is a much more simplified equation and is a lot easier to compute than the previous equation. The aforementioned definitions easily generalize, generalize to particle systems. It's useful to distinguish between internal and external forces. Thus, this right here is meaning, so this is actually supposed to say I, not J, right here. So let's, let's just uh, cross that out and I'll just put I. So sum of I, so the ith external forces acting on the ith particle plus the force of the jth particle acting on the ith particle is equal to the force, the total force, which is what is explained in here. But due to the weak form of Newton's third law, the force on the ith particle on the jth particle is equal to the negative of the fourth on the jth particle on the ith particle. Because of this, um, we can assume for this chapter that all internal forces cancel, and so we only care about external forces right here. We define the center of max to be this sum right here where we use total mass definition right here. The position of the center of mass is governed by this force law, where if you just look at it, that's F equals MA. Using this, we can come to the definition of total momentum, and this also leads us to total angular momentum. We can then use the rate of change of angular momentum to come up with torque right here, which basically says that the interparticle force is directed along this vector between the ith particle position and the jth particle's position, where this leads this restriction to mean that the time derivative of angular momentum is just equal to the external torque. Now if we introduce this idea of having a vo 
if we introduce this vector notation right here saying that the center of max right here plus some vector is equal to x sub i then we can define what where the ith particle is basically saying if there this is the center of mass and then this is where that vector leads to this vector points so to say to where x sub i is and so this notation or this equation right here is a good way to introduce position vectors relative to center of mass which is kind of a convoluted way to describe it so i apologize this leads us to the ith particle's velocity being this which then comes up with this completely annoying angular momentum term below luckily however this cancels out and we can just leave these two things where this is the angular momentum of the center of mass about some origin and then this is the angular momentum of all the particles about the center of mass. Normally we can choose an origin such that this term goes to zero and we only will have to compute this. You can see I have some things right here. My slide for some reason stopped recording but I still have some drawings left over. A similar idea holds for that of kinetic energy. So thank you for watching. And next episode will be 3.2 on two-body central force interactions.